Olympics last year, and Robin was, well, I mean, he gave a talk on COVID, when we were sort of just, just before we went to COVID, wasn't it? Yeah, it Took us through the current canal with a wonderful uh, words of, words of the <laughs> sun. Don't do that because we can't hear you. No. I met Robin on a cruise and I was so impressed with the talk that he gave on Paul around when we, when we were nearly at Corinth and afterwards that uh, I asked him rather cheerfully whether he would be willing to come to us and give the talk again. It's probably slightly different. Uh, I need to add that and that's that I have completely forgotten to organise um, a computer and a screen. So as I've said to him already, we're going to have to rely on his eloquence which I can assure you will not disappoint us. Um, just a word about uh, Robin, his background, if you don't mind. Uh, worked at Christie's, auctioneers. Uh, worked with Mother Teresa. It's a very checkered career he's had. Um, and so <laughs> took a theology degree, got ordained. Um, what else have you done? Yes, you were here as chaplain. Lincoln. Lincoln. Something else. Here I in Oxford. I taught theology. Yeah, I taught theology here. Um, still teaches theology in London. Um, but his post is Master of the Temple in the city of London, which I found absolutely fascinating. Anyhow, that's not why you've come. You've come to talk on Paul, so welcome. Georgia, thank you very much indeed. I'm not sure wary about checkered career. I think. The phrase you were looking for was rich and varied. <laughs> checkered. Checkered. Yeah, 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 right. Checkered. Okay. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I, I, George doesn't have to own up at all. Uh, I have to admit that, that I was going to rely upon some perfectly beautiful pictures, my sort of holiday snaps of Corinth. So if in doubt you were going to see a cruise ship going through the Corinth Canal, just to keep us happy for 90 seconds or so. But as it is, we haven't got that uh, addition. Uh, please bear with me, I am actually going to deliver the talk more or less as I had expected. You may think that as an overall view of Paul, it, is, it, it, it has now become a bit curious because my emphasis on Corinth, without pictures of ancient Corinth, might seem slightly arbitrary. But I hope that it will be su sufficiently um, uh, vivid and evocative to be a good and fitting emphasis starting point for the consideration of Paul as a whole. Now, George, you said, could I speak for something like 40 or 45 minutes, give time for questions afterwards? Absolutely. Uh, a couple of very quick notes. If it were to be before the 45 minutes are up, I have said anything that is wholly obscure or unintelligible or patently false, please raise your hand. I would rather not, as well as just, just lose everybody. If, if you're confused by what I have said, everyone else will be confused too. Much better that you ask. Uh, the other point is that I am told that I, I really have a voice rather like a horse race commentator. Yeah. I start rather slow and decorous and in a sort of gracious, rather powerful way, but after seven minutes I am dabbling faster than Peter O'Sullivan. If it turns out that I really have to call it up, again, please raise your hand and say, slow, slow down, uh, and we can then uh, pick up more of what it is that I'm is trying to say. So what I'd like to do, if I may, is start by, by just an overview, an imagination, an evocation of the city of Corinth when Paul gets there in AD 50. Uh, it had been an ancient city on the, on the isthmus between the main part of Greece uh, and the Peloponnese, and it was in consequence of it setting a wonderful trading spot, because everything had to go through that narrow isthmus from north to south, and anything that wanted to go by ship from east to west or west to east would need to cross this isthmus. There were dreams for centuries of building a canal. There were dreams for 2,000 years of, dream of building a canal before somebody finally did. And there was, in fact, a slipway uh, uh, across the isthmus so that, that um, merchandise could be shipped from one side to the other without having to take the long route round the Peloponnese and its very dangerous southern shores. So here was a city on the make, a mercantile trading harbour, transient populations, a lot of people quite seriously uprooted, 
Some people are undoubtedly making a lot of money, some people probably losing a lot of money, and a lot of people who did not have that settled social position in life into which, in less turbulent times, they would have been born, grown up, lived and died. There is one rather famous monument in Corinth, some of the monuments survived, to a man called Gnaeus Babius Philinus. He clearly had made a lot of money and wanted everybody to know, so he built himself an enormous monument with a dome and a cone of wax, on which he said, I, Gnaeus Babius Philinus, built this and I paid for it myself. He also admits that he was, no he doesn't, he boasts, that he was actually the city planning officer, so presumably he also applied to himself for permission to, gild, gild, to build it, and having given himself permission, he built it. So, some quite ostentatious money. Ancient city, uh, the archaic temple, probably to Athena, still stood, but it had been destroyed by the Romans in 146 BC, re rebuilt by Julius Caesar in BC 44 BC as a chiefly Roman city, and in a way, because it sits really between Rome on the one hand and the Eastern Empire on the other, it is a perfect, very unusual amalgam of Roman and Greek. Most of the inscriptions are in Latin, 200 years or more. Have I been inaudible for all the time? What should I do? Put it. Well, there you go. Off goes that one. On with the next. There we go. Okay, quick swap. Oops, excuse me. There we go. Vast horror rebuilt by the Romans. If you imagine that. Um, uh, a Greek Roman city centre. You, you, you actually do well to imagine on a great site a smaller scale, Parliament Square in London. Great civic space on which you have the Houses of Parliament, Whitehall, Westminster Abbey, and the Supreme Court. If, if you see what I mean, our Parliament Square, although we don't think of it like this, is effectively our national civic space for government, judiciary, law, and so forth. And if you imagine, instead of having a, a green sward and a statue of Winston Churchill in the middle, you imagine a far larger space around which people can walk, with more statues of heroes like Winston Churchill on it, you have some sense of what it is that the city centre in the Roman, Greek and Roman town would be on an enormous scale. The forum in Corinth is about 100 metres long and 150 metres wide, you see, it's so huge. Religions in Corinth. Well, of course, there were the, uh, the standard Greco-Roman religions. As I say, the Temple to Athena dominated the city centre. There were also temples to the imperial cult. The, the Romans and the Greeks were never quite sure what status to give to their emperors. The Romans were prepared to accept that their emperors were in some sense divine and that they would become gods when they died. Indeed, one Roman emperor, as he died, famously said, Whoa, I am becoming a god. Because in half an hour's time, having died, he would be in Roman mind. The Greeks, ever since Alexander the Great, seem to have been more accommodating, and they were prepared to accept that the extraordinary power embodied and encompassed within the emperor was in itself a sign of a living and present god yet. Not the same as the godhead of Zeus and so on, no, because clearly the emperor was going to die, even if he would then be elevated to some sort of heavenly realm. But even so, the Greeks were apparently more ready to accept that a mortal such as you and I was actually a god among the many gods. So, sacrifices, worship altars all over the place to be imperial fact. There were also, if you imagine, if you know uh, the Greek hillsides, you will know that nearby uh, there is Mount Parnassus, the home of Apollo, god of reason and clarity and sunlight and order, but also the god whose um, prophetess spoke in mysterious tongues by inspiration in Delphi, 
You will also know that uh, Dionysus, the god of, of disorder, chaos, imagination, wine, randomness, had his devotees, the Maenads, on the slopes of Parnassus too, the two great poles of Greek civilization, the rational and moderate, the chaotic. Sibylle, a nymph from the east, she had devotees in Corinth. They were, they, they were characterized in their worship by, by symbols of gongs, bronze symbols of gongs, uh, a strange sort of reverberant, undulating sound, clearly designed to create some sort of impression in the worship of, of ecstatic movement and worship of imagination and mind and heart together. And we know uh, from a Greek novel of the worship of Isis, whose devotees on their initiation were given some sort of voyage of the heavens and the underworld, were described as reborn, were clothed in the garments of the sun and displayed to other devotees. Initiation into the cult of Isis was, as it happens, very expensive. It was, by the author's own admission, suitable for lawyers. Since I work for the lawyers of London, perhaps I should set up a cult of Isis in my spare time. But it was not, frankly, accessible to most of the population. The cult of Isis had huge processions and festivals, especially in the springtime. The, the sailing season at Corinth, at Cancriae, the port of Corinth, was launched by a huge circus-like procession, which was dressing up music, fanfares, trumpets, the works, through the streets of Cancriae down to the harbour, where an image of Isis was then set out onto the scenes, so that Isis would bless the coming sailing season. And into this extraordinary, mixed, vibrant, unsettled, rootless, competitive society comes hope. What do you think of hope? I wonder what you think of hope. Um, I suspect that in our generation, any of us who know anything of Paul admire him hugely. You cannot but admire his courage, his determination, his tireless mess. 10,000 miles of more he travelled for the gospel. East, west, over and over again he would travel. And his own descriptions of his own sufferings, we have absolutely no reason to disbelieve him. A man that one can only be in some awe of, that he could live so resolutely determined to spread the gospel of Christ. But I suspect as well that some of us may not be sure that we like him. Slaves obey your masters, wives obey your husbands. It is not good for a man to touch a woman. There's something about this, something I suspect don't find very appealing in our age. There are things about his gospel which we might, in a nervous but honest moment, admit that we find it hard to credit. He appears to have been looking forward to the imminent return of Christ. Well, 2,000 years later, he hasn't come back. Did Paul get it catastrophically wrong? It is that, that is, by the way, the basis of his apparent slight denigration of marriage. Why, why get married and have children? Christ is coming back. But maybe, no. no. He speaks of Christ being the second Adam who will undo the failings of the first. While the first was disobedient, the second is obedient unto death. There are many of us, and we do not need to be Richard Dawkins, there are many of us who wonder about the first Adam and his historical existence and the fall and the admission into this world of sin and death through Adam in the Garden of Eden. And if we are uneasy about the role of the first Adam, we might become rather jittery about the role of the second. How can the second Adam 
undo a fault of the first island who never existed. We can get uneasy. So, I suggest that we are finding easier in our admire and Paul than to like him. What happened to Paul? By the way, I hope that in 20 minutes' time you, you will have come nearer to like him. If you see, if you see what I mean. I, think, I still think he would be a pretty difficult man to have Sunday lunch with, actually. It would be quite a sort of intense and relentless lunch. But I hope that at least there will be a fuller sense of why it is that we really, really might stand in some affectionate awe of this man and of his life. What happened uh, on the road to Damascus? <coughs> well, it's an extremely good question. Uh, it, it would have been answered, I think, probably by, by our predecessors as ministers of, in the ch uh, Church of England 150 years ago, probably, that, that Paul um, had been weighed down with the, the agony of his own relentless sinfulness and his absolute incapacity to fulfil the demands of the law. And he then, uh, as if... As if uh, extraordinary burst of spring fresh air as we have around us today, he realised that he did not need to be bound by every demand of the law if he was to win or remain in God's favour, because God's favour had been won for him and for all humankind by Christ and by Christ alone. And all he needed to do was trust in that gift of Christ's death and resurrection. And then, strenuously enough, but in confidence, live out its consequences in his own missionary life. The sense of that agony through which Paul had lived is based on a traditional reading of Romans chapter 7, in which Paul writes in the first person singular, it has only one real disadvantage, it's almost certainly not autobiographical. Now, widely suspected that this is a serious mystery of Romans chapter 7. And in Philippians chapter 3, Paul speaks of his life in Judaism before his conversion with apparent pride and eagerness and a sort of standing up straight and, chin, and uh, shoulders back and chin up. No sense of agony at all. On the contrary, he is proud of what he had been, but he realises that what he had been is now truth by comparison with what he is in Christ. But no sense of torment. No, 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 no sense of torture. No. The, other, the other answer, a 20th century answer, was that, um, that, 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 that and this is a ghastly argument, untrue to Judaism and, thank heavens, expunged since the Holocaust from Christian theology too, is that um, Judaism encouraged not torment but pride. Because if you fulfilled the law, you had a claim upon the God who had laid down that law. You could say, now look here, I have done everything you told me to do. So frankly, it's time for you to give me heaven. Uh, a, a sense of, of, of an arrogant righteousness, righteous demand upon God. Um, and it was believed for a long time that uh, this might be what Paul escaped his conversion. <laughs> this is a, a, a second, second version of Protestant theology, clearly fabricated in contrast to Roman Catholic theology of the 16th century, and also quite, um, quite false both to Judaism of the first century and to Paul himself. So, what did happen at Paul's conversion? Um, one preliminary, and then I get to try and answer. Completely speculative answer with which you may wholly disagree. And I give you due warning in advance that it is speculative. Here is the preliminary. We forever, we forever talk about Paul's uh, conversion. But in fact, when he speaks of it himself, uh, in Galatians in particular, he speaks of it in terms of a prophetic call. He uses the language of himself that Isaiah and Jeremiah had used of themselves on their calling to be prophets. Now, on that basis, we should perhaps not think of him 
as thinking of himself as a convert. No, no, no. He wasn't moving from one religion to another religion. He was becoming a prophet of the religion in which he had been brought up and in which he was ancestrally wholly secure. He was there to repristinate and revive and renew Judaism. He did not abandon Judaism. He was its greatest exponent, as he would say. Right, what might have happened? Bear with me if I introduce into the conversation a tradition of Jewish thought and practice which appears to have started somewhere about 100 BC, to have been rare but familiar at the time of Jesus and Paul, and then to find very significant expression in the three or four centuries thereafter. It is a mystical tradition. The basis of its mystical practice was the vision that Ezekiel had, chapter 1, Ezekiel chapter 1, of the throne chariot of God. According to Ezekiel, the God's throne is actually a wheeled throne. He was about to leave the temple. Wheeled throne. With cherubim. And upon the throne there sat one who was the likeness as the appearance of Adam, human being. Sheathed in brass, blazing brass, all the colours of the rainbow around him. This was a bass figure. And you notice he doesn't actually say it was a human being. He says it was the likeness as the appearance of a human being, Adam. Now, if, if you had asked any, any exponent of Ezekiel, well, like, who is it? Who is it on that throne? Or who is it? No, 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 no. Mad, mad, mad question. It is no individual person that we might see around us at breakfast in Corn Market. No, 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 no. Or wrong. We, you and I, are made in the image of God. Therefore, if there is to be any image of God that is visible, perceptible to human minds and eyes, it will look something like a human being. It, it, it just will. But not any particular human being. And that, that's positively... It, it's blasphemous even to think like that. No, no, but if you were to seek some vision of God, you would seek a vision of the figure who sat upon the throne and chariot of God in Ezekiel 1. And there were schools of visionaries who trained themselves to do so. This was a matter of long, concentrated, sustained asthesis or training. And uh, in the 1st and 2nd and 3rd centuries AD, there are very, we, we hear various rules about it. Um, we know the forms of training that they went through. Uh, we know that many more people, as it were, prepared themselves to see the chariot than ever actually did. Far more people expounded it than actually saw it. It was a very rare privilege to be given a sight of the chariot. It was a very dangerous text even to expound. Uh, we hear in the 3rd century that there was a rule that you could not be taught the understanding of the chariot vision unless you could already understand it, and so it didn't need to be taught it. And there's a very famous story of, of two rabbis, an elder rabbi sitting on his donkey, traveling along, and a, a, a pupil rabbi holding the water, and the pupil rabbi says, Master, he says, tell me the interpretation of the throne chariot vision. Well, I cannot possibly, my son, says the elder rabbi. You know I can't, because I can only teach you what it means if I know that you already know what it means. So the young man says, all right, father, I will tell you what I think it means. Very good, my son. So the old rabbi, he gets off his uh, donkey, he sits under a tree, he puts on his prayer shawl, and the younger rabbi gives his account of the chariot vision of Ezekiel. At the end of which, the rabbi says, he takes off his prayer shawl, he kisses the head of the young rabbi, and he says, well done, my son. You have understood the vision. There is no need for me to tell you what it means. Now, get me back onto my donkey and we'll carry on. There are three versions of the story. The simple one is that. The more elaborate one says that as the young rabbi expanded the chariot vision, the angels of God danced around them like groomsmen about the groom. The third, vision says, the third version says that as the young rabbi expanded the vision, all the 
trees around blazed with the fire of God's glory. Paul, uh, we know, after all, from the accounts in Acts of his conversion, was susceptible to visionary experience. And Paul himself says in 2 Corinthians 12, probably about himself, that he knows a man who was taken up to paradise, to the third heaven, that is, the court of God. Paul was a mystic. Paul was a mystic. And after all, he was in a tradition of mystics. What is the transfiguration, if not a mystical experience? Do you remember that Stephen, the first martyr, at the end of his trial, he says, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Stephen was a mystic. Only person. Paul. I, I suspect, but I admit this is speculative, I suspect that Paul was a mystical Jew who revered, even if he had not by then seen the throne chariot of God, and contemplated it endlessly. He wanted to pursue the Christians to Damascus, way beyond the remit of the Jerusalem Sanhedrin, because there was a tradition that Damascus would be the place to which the Messiah would come and be made visible to God's people. The, fact, the thought that the Christians had actually gone to Damascus to wait for the return of their false messiah was enough to have Paul riding northwards to counter them. And as he rode, he thought, he contemplated on the great vision of the true character who should alone be given the worship of any honourable Jew. The likeness as the appearance of Adam who sat upon God's throne. And I suspect that as he travelled northwards, he thought and he thought and he thought again. And he wondered, who is that figure that sits upon the throne of God? And he realised that the figure that sits upon the throne of God, on which God alone can sit, was the figure of Jesus. And if and when he once sees that, everything changes. Everything changes. And as it happens, everything that he will write over the next 20 years falls immaculately into place. Jesus is the figure, the likeness as the appearance of Adam, who sits upon God's throne where no one but God can sit. Do you know there used to be um there used to be an old story, uh, if, uh, any of you who did uh, theology 25 years ago, how lucky, uh, Oliver, you are that you are doing theology now, not 25 years ago. Because 25 years ago, we all knew, we all knew about Christology, we all knew that, that Jesus was a prophet, you see, and then rather like a helium balloon, Christology, that is, the understanding of Jesus standing, rose. Mark has a low view of Jesus, that's in the 60s. Matthew and Luke are rather high view. By the time we get to John, Jesus is God. But you see, do you know what has happened? Jesus has turned from being, uh, being, being a prophet, you see, into being a God. From being a, a Jewish prophet into being a Gentile God. Um, I'm sorry, this isn't very philosophical or theological language, but the only correct response to that reconstruction is Tosh. From beginning to end, Tosh. Paul, when writing to the Philippians in the 50s, appears to quote a hymn which he himself might have taught to the Philippians when he was there about 10 years before. That is, within 15 years of Jesus' death. There is a principle of Jewish monotheism that there is only one God, and to God alone shall the knee bow, and to no one else shall the knee bow. So Paul, in the letter to the Philippians, quoting a hymn current in the, Philippi in the Philippian community within 15 years of Jesus' death, says, 
Christ Jesus was in the form of God, but he did not think equality with God was something to be seized. So he humbled himself, he made himself obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, and has given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth to the glory of God the Father. Every knee shall bow to Jesus. This is unimaginable for the truth, unless Jesus has the authority that only God has. Notice how indirectly I am phrasing this. I am not saying that Paul said that Jesus was God. It is that Jesus has the authority that only God can have. Jesus sits where only God can sit. Jesus is given the worship that only God can be given. The tension that will define all subsequent Christology is already there. There's Jesus and there's God. And yet, and yet, and yet, they cannot be kept apart. They must be, as it were, separable, and yet they cannot be kept apart. And all of this in worship, in Christian worship, within 15 years of Jesus' death. So Paul starts his troubles, and if you don't mind, we're going to concentrate on Corinth, and on uh, oh, what happened there, and uh, by about quarter past one, we'll have seen, I'm afraid we will have seen that things didn't work out at all well, sadly. Um, Paul starts travelling around, and um, uh, he, uh, he actually, he actually uh, it's quite clever, he becomes, he, it is possible that he became a tent maker or sail maker uh, only when he started his missions. Uh, he was clearly a hugely sophisticated and educated man. Uh, tent making was a rather meagre manual trade. Most unlikely that someone, as it were, born to such a trade would become as well educated as, well, not impossible, but impossible. Uh, it is quite possible that when he started his mission, he realised that the thing to do was a tent maker. Because you had very, very modest equipment. You needed, you needed a, 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 a large needle that, which was curved to get through the canvas, and you needed a straight needle to get through the canvas, and you needed some thick thread. And, and once you've got that in your rucksack, you were basically employable anywhere. You were either going to make tents at the Isthmian Games in Corinth, or you were going to repair sails on the way to Corinth as you crossed the Aegean Sea. You were employable everywhere. You also, when you were working, you sat cross-legged and still in a relatively quiet place and you could talk to people. You could teach people as you worked. It is the perfect trade if you need to be mobile and yet still. He has allies. We think of Paul as being a sort of one-man band. That is not true. We shall see in a minute how he became very isolated. But he had allies and friends, and he really set up two great centres. He set up Ephesus uh, in the east, and he set up Corinth in the west. And, for, and he spent a lot of time in each, and these became the sort of centres of his mission. We hear a lot about the mission in Corinth itself from uh, Acts chapter 18, because there was an active synagogue in Corinth. So, we need to add to the list of religions active and represented in Corinth, the Jews. The Jews in the Roman Empire had a rather ambivalent standard. They were in many ways much despised and mocked. Um, they were circumcised, the men. Roman and Greeks thought that was horrid. Um, they, they, they were lazy, they took one day a week off. I mean, what? They took the salmon off. They wouldn't eat pork. There was all sorts of reasons to dislike them. And there were a lot of them. They're about 10% of the Roman Empire. And they kept themselves themselves a bit. So there were lots of reasons why people resented it and didn't like the Jews. On the other hand, people in many ways highly respected the Jews. They were very, very good at looking after each other. They were a genuine community, cared for each other. They were also monotheists. 
Um, of course, the, the classic Greco-Roman pantheon had hundreds of gods in it, and, and they were all done to worship. But actually, there were many Romans uh, and Greeks, not only among the most sophisticated sectors of society, who said there must surely, surely, actually be one supreme god. There may be many other lesser manifestations, of, yeah, 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 but surely there is one god. And the Jews were the one nation who said there is one god. So there was something, there was something a, 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 a very impressive, very appealing about the Jewish community. We know that there were those around, Gentiles, who were glad, at least by the third century, to be publicly acknowledged as God-fearers. Publicly acknowledged alongside synagogue communities as those who did not observe the whole Jewish law, the men were not being circumcised, they probably didn't keep the dietary regulations, but they were happy to be acknowledged as those who revered the Jews' God. So they kept up, no doubt, their pagan practices, but they also, as slight outsiders, slight outsiders, had a standing in the presence inside the synagogues. Anyway, Paul reaches Corinth. And he goes and speaks in the synagogue. Well, of course he does. He probably came with a recommendation from the Christian leaders in Jerusalem at this stage, rather a prestigious figure. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning we have our visitor, Saul, Paul, who has come to speak to us uh, about uh, God and the Messiah, Jesus. And one can imagine that all around the East Mediterranean, synagogue leaders were increasingly having a problem with this man, Saul, Paul. He was a Jew, he was preaching the Jewish God, and yet he was giving to this Jesus of his a standing, an honour, which was really becoming unimaginable. And the synagogue leaders in each case would just have to decide, can we take this or can't we? I mean, either we, either we have a guy in and he, and he speaks, or we... Oh, no, 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 we must get out. Anyway, the leader of the synagogue is called Crispus, and uh, Paul goes there on two Sabbaths, and uh, eventually the Jews, the, 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 the synagogue leaders say they, they, they can't have this, they really, really cannot have this. And so Paul uh, leaves the synagogue, and he goes to somebody who lives apparently more or less next door, called Titius Justus, who, that's a Roman name, that's a very specific Roman name, who is described as a god fearer. God fearer. But who appears to live closely in the neighbourhood of the synagogue. God, perhaps he had chosen to live there, actually. Perhaps that's actually where he, he wanted to live, near the synagogue. Still pagan, and yet, and yet respectful. And we are told that Paul goes to Titius Justus, and that Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, then converts to and comes and joins them in this house of Titius Justus where they meet. And, and, and one Corinthians is written by Paul and a man called Sosthenes. Well, we hear later in Acts 18 that the next, the successor of Crispus as leader of the synagogue, was called Sosthenes. Good heavens. So you mean five years later had he too conver converted, come across to this version of Judaism which Paul proclaimed? Absolutely great. This is absolutely gripping. So Paul begins to generate a community. It's, it's Jewish in basis, but it's outside the synagogue, attracts both God-fearers and former leaders of the synagogue. Pretty wrong bunch this is going to be. It is going to be quite a wrong bunch. It's quite an odd mixture of people. We hear a lot about the community uh, in the letters to, to Corinth. We should be aware that what we have are two or perhaps three letters out of five written from Paul, and we have none of the letters written from the Corinthians to Paul in return. We are hearing half of one side of a telephone conversation. So, I mean, unsurprisingly, it's, we, 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 it's very, very difficult to reconstruct what is really going on. But it does seem as though, as though the problems uh, are some, something like, something like the following. Um, there are, there are rich and poor in Corinth, as everywhere, and um, a particularly at a great pagan festival, huge amounts of meat would come onto the market of sacrificed animals. And there was a real question, if you were a Christian, could you eat the meat? from animals that have been sacrificed to pagan gods. That's a, that's a nice question, actually. 
And it clearly was a, a bitterly discussed question. It was extremely difficult. Uh, if you were, in particular, uh, the, 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 the great temples like the Ascapion, they had dining rooms around them. And so when meat had been, when animals had been slaughtered, people would invite their friends to dinner parties in the pagan temples while they would eat the meat from animals that had just been sacrificed. Well, if you were a Christian, could you get, could, could, could you go to a dinner party in a pagan temple where they would eat sacrificed meat? It's a very good question. It's a very good question. Or would there somehow contaminate with this? Uh, Paul instituted in Corinth, of course, the meal of the Last Supper, of the memorial of Jesus' death. If you know about uh, Greek or Roman dinner parties, an ordinary dinner party, what you did was you, the rich person, uh, and your, your guests would be in the large dining room, and you, you would um, you, you reclined. And around a square central table, and on three sides you reclined, and then the, the, your food was in there, and then at your feet and around the edge of the room would stand the sort of hangers on, these slightly second rate guests. And then the very third rate guests would be more actually outside in the cold. And believe me, Corinth in the winter is very, very cold. And it's clear that there were some of the rich in Corinth, that is, those who had houses big enough to welcome the whole church. They welcomed everybody in. Come on in for the Lord's Supper. Yes, please do. You're all hugely welcome. Now, let's have the smart people in the dining room climbing for the Lord's Supper. And let's have the slightly less smart people standing around the edge of the dining room, watching us eat and having the second cut of food. And then... No, I think you're probably in the hall, actually. No, I think actually you're visiting the outside under the snow in the courtyard, actually. Because that's how dinner parties worked. And for all the poor was proclaiming the equality, that is actually still how the dinner parties worked. And Paul berates them. They, you are, what, you are, what you are doing is turning the Lord's Supper uh, back into just a, a pagan dinner party. Don't do it! So then, oh, the other problem he has in Corinth, and this may not surprise us now that we hear about Sibylle and, uh, and the Minads and Apollo's prophetess, speaking in tongues, that the worship, whatever worship was like in Corinth, it was not like choral matins in the Temple Church in London. It was pretty riotous stuff. There was a lot of speaking in tongues. Well, there was a lot of speaking in tongues all over Corinth. There was. So when actually you have speaking in tongues in the tongues of angels in Corinthian worship, what they have brought in is the speaking of tongues that would have been familiar among the Minots. I mean, we, we, we've become part of Christian tradition, but in fact, it could be brought into the Corinthian church from the city outside of course. So these are the problems that face Paul in Corinth itself. Paul will soon have another and far more difficult challenge ahead. The leaders in Jerusalem are anxious about his preaching to Gentiles and not insisting that the Gentiles must obey the full Jewish law. What Paul has actually done is tell the God-fearers that if they become, as it were, Jesus Jews, they are fully-fledged members of the community without needing to take on the full burden of the Jewish law. They don't need to be circumcised, they don't need to observe, obey all the ritual obligations. They can become, as were Jesus Jews, and instead of being on the fringes or the outskirts, they are holy members of the community. This is enormously appealing. Gentiles are coming in, probably more Gentiles than Jews. When I think of Corinth, we're in the house of Titius Justus, a God-fearer. He is the host, it's his house, Christmas and Sosthenes have come over from the synagogue, but they're the guests now. This is in a Gentile household where the Jews are the guests, and where the, the Gentiles are wholly welcome as fully fledged members of the community without taking on observance of the Jewish law. The, the, the Christian leaders in Jerusalem are very angry. There was a meeting in Jerusalem, as you know, Acts 15, and um, they appear, to make, they appear to come to an agreement, Paul on the one hand, Peter and James on the other, but, but something goes badly wrong. There's a misunderstanding. And it is not long before in Antioch, Paul is again uh, encouraging Jews and Gentiles to eat together as a single homogeneous community without distinction. Peter turns up and he agrees this is absolutely fine. Somebody else from Jerusalem comes up from representing James, rather more conservative or austere, and he says, this is utterly unconscionable. 
You are corrupting this community by allowing Jews and Gentiles to be together. This is a Jewish community. And you are sullying it with these Gentiles from whom you do not demand conversion to Judaism. There is a terrible argument. Peter changes sides and sides with James. Paul has lost. Paul must leave Antioch. He will never return. And he is effectively from then on, on his own. He is no longer the apostle of truth from Jerusalem. He is no longer endorsed by, backed by, supported by the Jerusalem apostles. He is now a maverick, a complete loner, difficult man. Wherever he goes, they follow, undoing the damage that he is doing. Wherever he goes, they've been already doing the evil is Paul. Big trouble. So the Paul that we know was, for the last five or six years of his ministry, a, 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 a real loner. He had his own small group of allies, but in the eyes of the Jerusalem church, deep in He was also wildly overstretched. And Corinth shows it at its worst, really. He leaves, he spends 18 months there, he leaves, and there is chaos within a year. As they sink back into forms of syncretistic religion, paganism, snobbishness, social hierarchies, everything goes wrong again. He has not really managed in his 18 months to bed in the implications of the gospel for daily and social life. So uh, we started with Corinth, and there we end. Started with him uh, coming to this rather bizarre, uh, unsettled, vibrant, turbulent place, uh, working there for 18 months, then writing endless letters, and perhaps revisiting twice, perhaps. But if one is really honest, he leaves it still as a vibrant and turbulent and difficult place in which he has founded a vibrant, turbulent and difficult church. It will only be in decades and centuries to come when Jerusalem is destroyed, the Jerusalem church leaders are scattered, Jewish Christianity withers away. It is only then that Paul, Apostle to the Gentiles, will become the figure that we to this day know and revere. Thank you. Um, questions? Please. Churches which followed the gospel in their way. 
And it, it, it's possible one of the reasons why Acts just goes completely silent about it is that it was never accepted. The Jerusalem churches refused it. Yeah, because it was tainted. We don't know this, sorry, oh, that's, that's filling a silence. You know, that, that's, that's filling a silence. Oh, no, that's such a, that is such a good question. Um, to it, that is such a good question. To which I don't know the answer, and I don't know if anyone does. The trouble with all of we don't have all that many letters from Paul, and they are effectively, they are all occasional letters written in response to crisis, especially if you agree that the Romans is such a letter as well. It's not a sort of systematic treatise. So how, to what extent he is... Parts of his gospel to suit his audience. Well, the trouble is we have nothing from his audience. We, we do know something about Corinth, and I, I, I myself, I myself would think probably that it was in Corinth that speaking in tongues and ecstatic experiences in the congregation were, were, were most likely to be most current. And I would myself think surely this made it. They may not be mystics the way I am. I mean, they're not quite, but good heavens, so there is something going on here, and it is genuinely a gift of God. So I would, I mean, this, I, I, really, I really am speculating here. I would expect that, he, you know, as he, after a, a, a couple of months in Corinth, he was thinking, good heavens. There, there, is something, there is something afoot here which I have not come across before, but which properly, properly channeled is, is indeed a manifestation of an obedience to the spiritual God. I wouldn't surprise me at all. If you are the other dark and sad judgment, by the end, did, did, he, did he see how his own missionary methods might have been in part responsible for his own failure? I mean, I don't mean that meaning. How could he succeed in some ways? But, but here's a modern analogy, which I, 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 I just flitted. There, there was a very, very good book about decades ago now, called um, Christianity Rediscovered by Michael Vincent Donovan, who was a Jesuit who went out to the Maasai in Africa and um, determined to, to preach and be a missionary in the way that Paul had been. So that's what he did. He set up in the equivalent of Corinth and he spent over a year there. And good. And he then went out to different places and he went around. Uh, good. To, just, just as Paul had, because he wanted to recreate it. And the whole point was, what he did not want to do was become another of these Western missionaries who plonks down a church, a school, a hospital and a mission, stays there for decades, and as it were, recreates African Christianity in the image of European Christianity. I, he said, I'm going to do what Paul did. And that's something, it's very moving. I mean, this is, and this was the commitment of his entire life. It's very moving. Anyway, he, of course, in, the, in the, his HQ town, he, he, um, he, he taught them about baptism, he did the baptizing in the river, and all this sort of stuff, he did all this stuff. He went away, and he comes back two years later. Chaos. What he did not know is that in Maasai religious mythology, I'm sorry, I've got the details wrong, you, you wash your cows in the river of the new moon because it prevents them getting diseased or something. And this had got tied up with baptism. So the Maasai were now baptizing their babies by night at the new moon in the river to stop them getting diseases. What? What? And actually Donovan is very honest that he realized that he's, he's here no more in this place. And of course the same, even more so, in the places where he had only spent two or three weeks and then appointed a local leader. He said, I, The, the ways of centuries, the ways of centuries are not unwoven by a year, let alone by a month of missionary presence. And um, it's a very, I, I, it's an utterly inspiring book because of his courage in doing what he did. And then the honesty with which he admits, no, that didn't. Any more questions?
from my time of projects. And I wonder if you can let you I wonder if you mentioned the small temple behind the tree wall. Did you? No, so you can. Right. Um, this Please. say a magical experience, mystery, <laughs> mystery <laughs> of, of Paul and I think I find it most encouraging that uh, the two sort of founder members of what Christianity has become were in their time failures because I think that that actually says something quite profound about the Christian religion is that we believe in failure and how failure out of failure comes something which is truly divine. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much indeed. Real pleasure to be here.